Greetings and welcome to worship on this, the 11th Sunday after Pentecost. Today we're going to worship under the theme that God satisfies our needs. And in the sermon today, we're taking a look at the miracle of the feeding of the 5,000. Let's begin in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity but I am truly sorry for my sins and trusting in my Savior, Jesus Christ. I pray, Lord, have mercy on me, a sinner. And God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us and has given his only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. And therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in Christ Jesus. Amen. Again, our text for this morning is, uh, to this morning's consideration is Matthew chapter 14, beginning with verse 13. Verses 13 through 21, actually, I'll be referring to them during the course of the sermon. the name of Jesus, truly our priceless treasure and our fount of purest pleasure, dear friends. Sometimes, sometimes we run across someone who says to us that they'll do something for us. Maybe they say they'll mow your lawn while you're on vacation, take your package to the post office, let you use their truck to move some furniture, and the like. And you respond by saying, really, you sure that's going to be okay? To which they say, sure. You can count on me. Now be honest. When someone says you can count on them, do those words reassure you? Or maybe do they make you even a little more skeptical? It's, it, it's almost as if the person has to add those words because they know we're not quite sure that we can trust that they'll follow through. And after all, how many times have we been let down by people who told us not to worry, and they take care of everything, that we could count on them? So we come back from vacation, and the lawn is knee-high. That package didn't get mailed because it was forgot forgotten under the front seat of our neighbor's truck. Other arrangements had to be made at the last minute to move that furniture because, well, our friend with the truck never showed up. You see, we'd like to count on others for things, but as we live in a sinful world, we've become convinced that we, we have to be ready to be disappointed. Well, even though others may let us down, there is still one we can always count on. Today, we're gonna learn that lesson. We're gonna learn you can count on Jesus. Most importantly for your spiritual needs, but he doesn't forget about us after taking care of those. Nope, you can also count on him for your physical needs. Today we find Jesus on the remote coastline off the Sea of Galilee. He had arrived at this location by boat, hoping to be alone with his disciples for a while because, after all, they had just returned from their missionary journeys and probably had lots to talk about. But Jesus also wanted some time alone to digest the news that his cousin, John the Baptist, had been beheaded by King Herod. And add to all this the rigid schedule he had been keeping, healing and teaching so many. And it was plain, just, it was plain to see that Jesus, he needed time to get away from it all. He needed a break. Well, we learned today, you didn't get one. Look at verse 13 to open our text. When Jesus heard what had happened, that was to John the Baptist. He withdrew by boat privately to a solitary place. Hearing of this, the crowds, though, followed him on foot from the towns. How do you think Jesus felt when he arrived at this remote location, only to discover that this location was no longer remote? 
We all know how it feels to have our problems follow us home from work or tag along with us on vacation. So how would you have handled the crowds Jesus found waiting on him? Keep sailing, Peter. We'll land at another port where they can't find us. That's not what our Savior did, though. Here's why we can count on Jesus. Jesus showed that he cared too much just to send the people away. Here's what happened. When Jesus, found, when Jesus landed and saw a large crowd, he had compassion on them and healed their sick. Key word here is compassion. He had compassion on them. If you look at the Greek language, its word means he was filled with tenderness toward them. His heart went out to them because he didn't just see a bunch of nameless faces standing in front of him, a mob of people following him because, as John tells us in his gospel, they saw the miraculous signs he had performed in the sick. No, in Mark's gospel, we're told Jesus saw these people as sheep without a shepherd people who needed him not only did jesus have a not only did jesus have a strong desire to heal those who were sick his concern concern for them went much deeper because above everything else he cared for them spiritually again using some of the other accounts on this uh other gospels on the same account we have more information for example luke's account of this day adds the details that jesus also spoke to them about the kingdom of god Jesus had compassion on these people and taught them what they really needed to know, the way of salvation. Good news for us, we have the same Savior showing the same compassion to you and me today. We can count on Jesus because he cares about us, even though we often wander from the fold like distracted sheep. But that's why he came, to seek and to save what was lost. So you can count on Jesus to teach you about life, death, sin, grace, heaven, and hell in his word. Everything you need to know to be saved. But how sad it is that we often overlook the spiritual needs that he wants to fill for us. Instead, we look to Jesus, we want him to feed us, fix our marriage, make us look prettier, make us stronger, make school and our job easier. But what Jesus wants above all else is to take us to heaven. And he himself gave us his word in John chapter 6. He said, everyone who looks to the Son and believes in him shall have eternal life. That's his promise. Jesus cares about all those still living in darkness. He truly wants all to be saved and to come to a knowledge of the truth. So being children of God already, we can learn from our Savior's powerful example to show Christ-like compassion on the shepherdless sheep of this world by pointing them to the good shepherd. Yes, we can let others know that they too can count on Jesus for all their spiritual needs. Jesus has solved our spiritual dilemma. That's our greatest need. It's been taken care of. Now we're assured that as Peter writes, it says, through faith, we are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is already to be revealed in the last time. In other words, don't stop counting on Jesus, for he also now promises to take care of all our physical needs while we're waiting for him to take us home to heaven. Again, in John's gospel, we're told that Jesus confronted the disciples with this predicament of how to feed this large crowd of people. Sure, Jesus already did know what he was going to do, but he wanted to test this, the faith of the disciples to see what they would come up with. And here's Here's the best solution they had. You look at verse 15. This evening approach, the disciples came to him and said, this is a remote place. It's already getting late. Send the crowds away so they can go to the village and buy themselves some food. Well, the disciples failed the test. They just said, send the people away. It's not our problem. Didn't they remember how Jesus had miraculously provided more wine at the wedding of Cana? And didn't they know he could do the same here and produce food for these people? Or could it, be a, could, could it be a case of them not having the same compassion of Jesus? We remember how they rebuked those moms who brought their children to Jesus for his blessing. Now they want to send these people away too. Were they, were they really concerned about these people getting back to town so they could get some food? Well, perhaps. Or maybe did the disciples just not want to be bothered with them anymore? 
Well, either way, their solution wasn't acceptable to Jesus. He told them, they do not need to go away. And why not? Because Jesus says, here, I want you to solve the problem. Jesus, you give them something to eat. Well, the disciples had already assessed the situation, and they just lamented, we have here five loaves of bread and two fish. And a little boy had brought his lunch. That's all they had. And so the disciples despaired. Well, Jesus cared. They still hadn't learned to count on him. And let's admit it, we're, we're not much better at times. Uh, think about when the checkbook flashes zeros. Think about when your health or the health of a loved one that you care about um, diminishes. When, when you struggle with everyday life at home, at work, at school, well, it's easy to recognize, hey, we're all in need. And, add, and you add to all this an annoying virus uh, to what we once considered the normal challenges of life. And we're quick to acknowledge that life can be frustrating. It can be difficult, something that none of us is able to handle on our own. Yes, we need help. We need someone to count on. We need Jesus. And in that Son of God, we have a Savior who possesses incomprehensible love, almighty power, and infinite compassion. Yes, the same compassion that led him to Calvary's cross. We're invited to turn to him, to cast all your anxiety on him for this reason, because he cares for you. You can count on Jesus. And on the shore of that remote coastline off the Sea of Galilee, Jesus met both the spiritual and physical needs of the people that day. For having fed their souls, it was now time to feed their bodies. Look in verse 19. Taking the five loaves and the two fish and looking up to heaven, Jesus gave thanks and broke the loaves. Then he gave them to the disciples, and the disciples gave them to the people. First, Jesus had taught the people about the kingdom of God. Now it was time to take care of their other need. A lesson for the people and for the disciples that day, seek first God's kingdom and his righteous and all these other things like food and clothing will be given to you as well. A message that belongs in our hearts still today. Yet there was that one problem. The crowd was just a little too large for such a small buffet. Verse 21, it says, the number of those who ate was about 5,000 men, and that's beside women and children. So we're talking about a crowd, possibly over 10,000 people, and such a crowd would keep all the concession stands busy down at Intrust Arena for an event. But they're already stocked with food and drinks well in advance. Here, Jesus only had at his disposal these five loaves and two fish. That's all he needed. We were told in verse 20, they all ate and were satisfied. The Greek word used here was often used for the feeding and fattening up of animals. So in other words, this massive number of people who hadn't eaten all day was now able to eat enough to be full. And then we have that neat part of the miracle. We we're told in verse 20, the disciples picked up 12 basketfuls of broken pieces that were left over. Start out with five small loaves, two fish, and you get 12 baskets of leftovers. That's like looking in the fridge for those extra couple of pizzas, pieces of pizza left over from the night before and finding 12 full pizzas instead, something like that. Well, the disciples, along with the entire crowd of people, what a lesson they learned that day, that you can count on Jesus. So what do we learn from this? Do we really have any reason to worry about anything with such a Savior taking care of us? No, he, he may not always choose to use miracles today. Matter of fact, he may also use natural means. That doesn't mean that he's not there for us in any and every situation. The Psalms are told this, he makes grass to grow for the cattle and plants for man to cultivate, bringing forth food from the earth. So usually natural means. As is often the case, he still gives us more than we need. If you have a garden at home, you know there's always extra for family and friends. School starting up, once again, parents maybe wringing their hands a little bit about the cost of clothes and school supplies. Yet, I doubt if any of you has ever had to go hungry just so your children could attend school. It's because God provides. And sometimes maybe it's just a matter of adjusting our priorities, separating luxuries from the actual things that we really need. 
So we can admit with David when we pray, the eyes of all look to you and you give them their food at the proper time. Yes, you open your hand and satisfy the desires of every living thing. Which means somehow the checkbook does stretch to the end of the month. Sure, we may get sick at times, but it appears as if the healthy days still outnumber the sickly ones. And we might have that occasional bad day at school or work, but we realize that we often look how many good and pleasant days we have. So we realize Jesus doesn't leave us high and dry while we're waiting for heaven. No, he's always there for us, providing for us in his own way. And yes, you can count on Jesus for all your physical needs. The fact that you're here this morning is evidence of that. For the most part, you're dressed in nice clothing. Not too many of you had to hitchhike to get here. You're sitting in uh, an air-conditioned uh, comfort on padded pews, and you look pretty well fed. That's your, if, you're, if you're in worship. If you're watching this online, not that much different. I'm sure you have clothes that, that are comfortable. Uh, you're, you're in a, a wonderful home with a roof over your head. Probably have air-conditioned comfort there. Probably a padded uh, chair as well. And I imagine you're still looking pretty well fed. And yet the greatest evidence of your Savior's love and compassion isn't something you can see on the outside because it's in your heart. It's found in the faith that you have, the work of the Holy Spirit, that brings you to hear his word, to praise God for taking care of your greatest need, giving you a Savior from sin. So now with that problem solved, let, let's join with Paul in asking ourselves this simple question that comes from Romans chapter 8. He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also, along with him, graciously give us all things? Amen. May the Lord be with us as he was with our fathers. May he never leave us nor forsake us, but may he turn our hearts to him so that we walk in all his ways. Amen. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Eternal Father, Lord of creation, source of all our abundance and answer to all our needs, we, your unworthy creatures, come before you with praise and thanksgiving. You give all creatures their food in due season. You open your hand. You satisfy the needs of every living thing. You've made, pro you've made provisions for our souls by sending your son, Jesus Christ, as a token of your love. For all these physical and spiritual blessings, we give you thanks. For a world suffering from persecution, famine, nakedness, peril, and war, we implore your mercy. Give us compassion for the hungry and use us to alleviate their suffering. As you miraculously fed the 5,000, so multiply our gifts. They may be sufficient to meet the desperate needs of many of our fellow human beings. Make those involved in administering to the needs of the world careful managers of the, re of the resources available so that nothing is wasted. Grant nations that have plenty a spirit of generosity towards those less fortunate. Give assurance to those who are suffering that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate them from the love of God in Christ Jesus, our Lord. And dear Savior God, today we praise you for bringing us to know how you love us and have already forgiven us. As many students return to classrooms in person or online this fall, we humbly ask you to accompany them with your truth. May whatever way they learn this year bring many benefits to their lives and a better appreciation of your wisdom and love. Allow their study and thirst for knowledge to remain in its proper place, a tool to be used in this life. But may the earthly wisdom they gain never become a substitute for the gift of spiritual wisdom and faith in you. Preserve their faith, Lord. Guide their daily decisions. Allow them to grow in your grace and knowledge. This we ask in the name of our compassionate Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. 
Amen. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, and serve the Lord with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Amen. Greetings again and welcome. We're glad you're able to uh, bring up this video and join us in worship online. Again, an invite for you. If you're healthy and able to consider coming back to live worship on Sunday morning, our attendance has been increasing as we take protocols to keep things safe and yet to enjoy gathering as the body of Christ. Still our Bible classes for the most part this week are online. Monday night, we're going back to our, our study of the Old Testament, finishing up the book of, of Joshua, if you'd like to join us. That's at 7 p.m. I'll send out the links later uh, today. And then you have Tuesday afternoon Bible information class at 2. And Tuesday evening at 7 p.m. is our study of the book of Proverbs. We're actually wrapping that up as well. And we'll be taking a, uh, a look at uh, what we might want to do next with that time slot that we have. Confirmation is live. Uh, finishing that up. Uh, that's this Wednesday at 7 p.m. And then we'll be back with you in worship, either online or in person next Sunday. My prayer for you is that you have a blessed week, if I can be of any service to you in any way. Give me a call if you're looking for a visit, since you've, if you've been unable to make it to worship. Let me know as well. I'd be happy to do that uh, as, as long as I can, as long as uh, it, it's permissible. So blessings on your week. We'll look forward to seeing you again soon. Thanks.